I'll tell you what today's topic is going to be because as usual people ask me and somebody asked me just a couple of minutes before I get, came in here to talk about self-hate. So tonight's talk will be upon self-hate. So if you want to go out to the door quickly, please go so now because it's going to be on self-hate. <laughs> I didn't mean that, people were already getting up to go. <laughs> it's okay. And it's not only just self-hate, but actually how to overcome self-hate and have freedom from self-hate. But it's a nice topic for a talk, as all these suggestions are, because this is one of the problems which people have in the world. Either what they call direct self-hate or indirect self-hate. The top of self-hate which you can recognize and know, but also the subtle one. Many people will know what happens when you have really great self-hate and you have all the psychological and social problems which happens when you have self-hate. That people go and get lost in taking drugs or alcohol, they run away, they escape, they become monks. No, they don't. That's not <laughs> self-hate. <laughs> that is actually the overcoming of self-hate. But it's interesting that people come to me as a monk, you know, the counselling, the free counselling, because monks don't charge. And a lot of time it's like self-hate. And because of that self-hate, they don't allow themselves to be at peace and have happiness. And in a deeper sense, they don't allow themselves to get into deep meditation, to bliss out, even to get enlightenment. In fact, you can call self-hate one of the great obstacles at all levels of people's search and progress towards happiness. So we're going to investigate today what self-hate is. And if you think you haven't got self-hate, you have. A little bit anyway. And I'm going to point that out to you. One of the little stories. Because uh, Prezi saw, he was the president, and said there's many new faces here before. I love it when he says that because I can tell all my old stories again. <laughs> but even though you've heard this story before, it's a great tale. Because it actually shows what self-hate really is. And in a, in a way which many people don't realize when they first hear the story. You know the old story, the seven monks in the cave? Those of you who haven't heard this story before, seven monks meditating in a cave a long time ago. And they're meditating on, on love, the opposite of, of self-hate. And it's like the Buddhist idea of love. May all beings be happy and well. The door of my heart is open to all beings, no matter who you are, no matter what you do. I love the whole world and all its beings. No enemies, just everyone gets just, uh, included in selfless, unconditional, universal, cosmic love. So we'll get an idea of what these monks were doing. And in this cave, they had a group of bandits, robbers, evil men, found that cave in the middle of the jungle and straight away they thought that would be a wonderful headquarters, a hideout from us. We can stay in that cave and we can go out into the towns and villages and cities. We can rob, we can plunder and then we can come back and hide in here. No one would ever catch us. It was so secluded. But they realized that they had to kill every one of those seven monks because if one monk was allowed to live Sooner or later they'll tell the authorities on where that cave was in the jungle. So they wouldn't be able to use it as a hideout anymore. So they wanted to kill every of those monks. Now it happened. Like it's very common in monasteries, especially in modern times. The head monk, or in case it's a nun's monastery, the head nun, is a very good talker. <laughs> And don't ask me how, but it did happen that the head monk of those seven managed to talk those robbers into letting everyone go except one. One would have to be sacrificed as a warning to all the rest to keep quiet. Now, that head monk, that's the best he could do. He had to choose one of those monks to die so everyone else could go free. Now those of you who have heard this story before, who know the answer, be quiet. Please don't give it away. Now, who was chosen to die? 
There was a head monk himself. He was a first monk. Number two was his best friend. Number three was his brother. Number four was his enemy. They never got on together. Number five was a very old monk. He was so old in years, he could die any day anyway. So what's the point? The next monk was a very sickly monk. He was always going to the doctor. He was always getting checkups for this and checkups for that because he was so sickly that he was about to die too. And the last of the monks, in this seven, group of seven monks, and there's always one of these monks in every monastery, he was the useless monk. <laughs> they used to, <laughs> when it came to doing any of the chanting as the monks do, he couldn't remember any chants. When it came to meditation, he was the one who would snore. <laughs> when it came to taking his food, he'd sort of dribble, he'd be fat and all sorts of stuff. He was a useless monk. Now, I'll go through those groups of monks again because I'm going to ask you, who was chosen to die? Seven monks, a head monk, his best friend, his brother, his enemy. Never liked him anyway. The next monk was a very old monk who could die any time. So, you know, just, you know, why not now? Sick monk also could die as well. Do you think they would put him out of his misery? What about the useless monk? Could put him out of everyone else's misery. <laughs> which monk, which monk did he choose to die? Now those who have heard this story before, please be quiet. <laughs> those who haven't heard this story, any suggestions? Himself. Thank you so much for making my evening because you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> People always say himself and if you didn't say that, the whole reason for telling this story would not actually be fulfilled. Especially because I'm talking about self-hate tonight. That is the wrong answer but that is the answer which comes to everybody's mind first when they first hear this story. I think he sacrificed himself. It seems to be so obvious, but that is wrong. Now, to stop wasting time, I ask, usually ask people, who else do you think they, um, they sacrificed? And some people say the sick monk, some say, people say the old monk, some people even suggest the useless monk. Oh, just people are so cruel and uncharitable. Because <laughs> the right answer was that he couldn't choose. Can't choose. Because remember, I started saying that this was unconditional love these monks were practicing. And the head monk was supposed to be the expert on this. So unconditional love means you cannot choose between yourself and another. His love for his brother was exactly the same as his love for his best friend, no more, no less. Which was exactly the same, no more, no less, than his love for his enemy or the old monk or the sick monk he couldn't distinguish between them in terms of his love they all had their place in his heart without any preference for one for the other even the useless monk was loved equally even with the best monks and most of all his love for himself was no more and no less than his love for all other beings and that's a powerful little story there because why is it that we say he sacrificed himself? Self-hate, that's why. Strange, isn't it? <laughs> that we always think that that's what he did. And when you look at it, even in, I mention this also because in Christianity as well, exactly the same, Jesus said to love your neighbour as yourself. Not more not less as. Which means to love yourself as your neighbour. No more, no less. So why is it that as human beings that we will be prepared to give our life first? And the reason is, is because we don't treat ourselves the way we treat others. We can love another person. We find it hard to love ourselves. Sometimes it's our society does this. Society of martyrs. Martyring yourself. Because you will take the punishment thinking that that way other people 
could be happy. And when everyone takes that martyrdom, no one is happy. We're always giving up our happiness for someone else. And when everyone else does it, that no one is happy in this world. We're all sacrificing for something else, for somebody else. Now, here, we're looking that there's something very deep in there. It is called self-hate. We don't want ourselves to be treated like other people. You can forgive others. You can let go of other people's fault. You can understand them you know, when they make a mistake. But can you understand yourself when you make a mistake? Can you also be forgiving to yourself when you make a mistake? Here comes today's joke. I always like to... <laughs> <laughs> I always like to sort of to split the sort of the serious stuff with a little bit of a joke, just so you know, varieties of, you know, was it s- sweet and sour? That's my talks. Now, a boy came home from school and he told his father, he said, Father, I had a great day at school today. The teacher asked a question and I was the only child in the whole class who knew the answer. And the father was quite surprised because usually he was a scallywag. He always comes bottom of the class, always getting into trouble. And so the father said, what, really? The teacher asked a question, you were the only one with the right answer. He said, yes. And because, you know, your parents, you should encourage your children. So the parent took $10 out of his wallet. Here you are, son. Well done. And of course the child smiled and took the $10. And as he was heading for the door, the father said, well, what was the question anyway? Oh, the question was, who's, who broke the school window? <laughs> <laughs> I was the only one who did the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> we all make mistakes, but the wise people <laughs> make use of their mistakes to their financial advantage. <laughs> so... So why are we always down upon ourselves and hate ourselves when we make mistakes? Why can't we forgive ourselves, is the point. And it's because we've got this terrible thing called self-hate. Now where that actually comes from, I've seen that, it comes from our conditioning in our life. Because we're trying to encourage ourselves, you know, to grow in the world, to be good people, to be successful, that whenever we make a mistake, we're almost taught to hate that mistake, thinking that, When we hate mistakes, when we hate the faults, when we really find out what's wrong in ourselves and in the world, we fix that up, we'll have a better world, we'll have a better me as well. It's called like sort of that competition growth, which is why that we have these school systems where we're always pushed to sometimes somehow succeed. And what really is that success anyway? Okay, you may come top of the class, and then but you get put in a bigger class, you know, and you have to sort of compete with other people. And then you go into a university, you've got to compete there, and then there's always com- competition. And are you ever good enough? You know, in our school system, even if you get the very, very, very best marks, there's always someone else who gets a better mark than you. And this is one of our problems. There, we're almost encouraged and taught in our life, to compare ourselves with other people. There is our problem. As a girl, you've got to compare yourself to those beautiful pictures in the glossy magazines. And as you all know, those glossy magazines, they are all digitally enhanced. I'm sure that one of these days someone's going to get a photo of me and digitally enhance it and put hair on it and goodness knows what else. But (laughs) it's not true. We're comparing ourselves to something which does not exist. It's the same with you're a boy and you want to sort of compare yourself to being cool or whatever. You're comparing yourself to something which isn't true, which isn't real. And when we don't live up to that fantasy, that's when we get self-hate. And it's unfortunate that some of our parents, they want the best will in the world, they want to encourage you, they want to you know, make you do well in the world, but when they sort of push you so hard, it gets into this, I can never be good enough. I can never actually you know, live up to the people who loves me, who loves, loves me, yeah, the people who love me, I can never live up to them. And then after a while, these little seeds of self-hate 
get implanted in us more and more and more and more. If that gets really, really gross and great, then we have to run away from ourselves into drink, alcohol, all sorts of abuse and also avail a lot of psychological self-abuse as well. All coming from this self-hate business. And it's fascinating just how people can't accept themselves as they are. I remember one of the stories, a very lovely little story. In here, when we first came here, there was a lady who, she was dying of, I think, cancer or something. And I was just counselling her, being a friend at the very end. And one day, I sort of, it was actually in our little office over here, I asked her, OK, you know, you've only got a few, few weeks to live. What's the worst thing you've ever done in your life? I asked her that. What's the worst thing you've ever done in your life? And I said, I promise I won't tell anybody. <laughs> and I've broken that promise so many times. <laughs> I'm sure she doesn't mind. I've told hundreds, thousands of people this. Because I think it's very cute. And this is about, she was a maybe about 60-year-old lady. So what's the worst thing you've ever done? And you know, she looked sort of very shifty for a little while. Her eyes went left and right. But then she decided, no, she's got to tell somebody. And if you can't tell a monk... You can't trust a monk. Actually, you shouldn't trust a monk. <laughs> <laughs> no, the monk's got the, the, the heart in the right place. She said that once in her life, she kissed somebody else's husband. And she said, she just kissed her. Kissed somebody else's husband. She had her own husband. She kissed somebody else's husband. And I said, Look, madam, if that's the worst thing you've ever done in your life, that's pretty good. <laughs> What's the worst thing you've done in your life? <laughs> Well, that's not that bad, is it? Okay, then they were just you know, kissed another man's husband, another woman's husband. That's not such a bad thing. But it's amazing that once she said that, and once it was out, she saw it as not being such a big thing. But when it was inside of her, she was so afraid to tell anybody, out of fear, what that little fault became huge. And it was marvelous release for her to tell someone else and realize, oh, it's not such a bad fault. She wasn't perfect, sure. It's not that bad. It's only a small thing. You know, didn't sleep with him. You didn't sort of you know, have an adulterous affair or anything. You just kissed him once, that's all. No big deal. So, when we actually look at it that way, the, she felt so much better because that was something which was causing her self-hate. She never felt good about herself. She felt guilty. I don't know, that may have been one of the causes of the cancer, I'm not sure, quite likely, because this is what happens when we have self-hate, that just our whole body system, our mind system, starts to go wrong. You don't say it's a good thing to do, to go around kissing other people's husbands, but, you know, we make mistakes in life, you know, we do things wrong, but, you know, what we say with love, with lack of self-hate, is we accept those mistakes, we forgive those mistakes, we learn from those mistakes. So I said before, the old AFL code, accept, forgive, learn. We accept it, we acknowledge, okay, I did that, we forgive it. And the forgiving means we don't have self-hate, we don't want to punish ourselves. Unfortunately, again, our society, when we make a mistake, we ask for punishment. Strange thing in the life, we can't forgive ourselves, we think, it's almost brainwashed into us. If you make a mistake, you have to be punished. If no one else punishes you, you want to punish yourself. Because it's called guilt. What guilt means is, when you're found guilty, a judge has to somehow wrap this gavel on the wooden bench and then pronounce your sentence, your punishment. And we make this guilt and punishment go together so much that when we have self-hate, we've made a mistake, we want to punish ourselves. And that self-hate is our punishment. If no one else will punish us, we want to punish ourselves. Just like that lady, she kissed another man's husband and she sought for some sort of punishment. Instead of just absolution, forgiveness, relief. Just acknowledge it, forgive it and learn from it. So you don't do it again. Find out why you did that and what the purpose was. And just how just it was a silly thing to do. And then let it go. It's gone. Finished. Otherwise, we get into this like self-hate business. So we've got comparison with others, you know, trying to be the best or trying to at least be somebody. And we've got sort of making mistakes. So those are all the causes for like self-hate. And you see what this happens with a person. 
when it happens, it's just a meaning we can never be at peace with ourselves. Because we've built up this idea of this being inside of us who's not good enough, who makes mistakes, who needs punishment. And that's one of the reasons why we can never come to know ourselves truly. We're always running away from someone we're afraid of. Someone we think does not match up. Someone who thinks you know, deserves some punishment. We are on the run from, I don't know, some idea of a law. Now, after we stop all this self-hate business with like, loving kindness, when we can actually see what it really is, we see just how stupid it is. No one wants you to be unhappy, so why do you cause unhappiness for yourself? All this competition business, which we have, trying to be the best. Isn't it wonderful to be in a society where everybody is valued, everybody has their place? I was taught that by our monks in Thailand, especially people like Ajahn Chah, who would always compare human beings to trees in a forest. Because as monks we used to live in the jungles, in the forest, and we got most of our teachings actually from looking at nature. And you look at nature and every animal, every being, insect, tree, bush, in that jungle was necessary. These days we call it for the ecosystem. If you take one of those little animals out of that ecosystem, the whole thing gets out of balance and the whole forest suffers as a result. Each one of you are part of the ecosystem of humanity. If you take just one of you out of that ecosystem, the whole world suffers. You are essential. Isn't that lovely to understand? Each one of you is absolutely necessary. That's why when people come to my monastery, I say, I'm so happy to see you. Because if they never came, we wouldn't eat. That's why I'm happy to see you. <laughs> no, it's only a joke, really big. I'm very happy to see you if you don't, even don't bring any food. Each one of you is necessary. When you, look, when you look at things that way, you can actually see each one has their place in the world. Even the crooks in this world are out there to sort of, you know, especially the burglars. They're so compassionate because they teach you to let go of your attachments. <laughs> no, I don't know if I'm pushing the envelope a bit too much there, but when a person is sick, sick people are just wonderful gifts to this world because they teach other people about compassion. So everyone has their place in this world. Everyone is necessary. Now I'm saying that because otherwise we think, I'm really hopeless, I'm useless, what's my place in this world? I've never done anything for anybody else. No, it's not true that way. There's one person I heard about, he, he was like a person like this, who valued everybody, who saw the good in everybody, who has not had this fault-finding mind, would always see the faults in people. Until somebody said, okay, what about Adolf Hitler? Can you see anything good in him? Without any hesitation, he replied, Adolf Hitler, yes, he was a leader in his field. <laughs> you would even see the good part about anybody. Now what we're actually saying here is that concept which we have in, in Buddhism, it's Mahayana Buddhism, but I think this is a great part even for Theravada Buddhism, everybody's got Buddha nature. Everybody's got a seed of goodness and purity, absolute purity inside of them. And if we actually start to notice that inside of us, the Buddha nature, whatever you think a Buddha is, some perfect, virtuous, peaceful, ultimate compassionate, you know, your ideal of the, the ultimate human existence, the full potential of you, to see that as a little seed inside of you, a Buddha nature inside of you. And if you can actually see that inside of you, how can there ever be any self-hate anymore? You see that inside, almost like a central part of you, is this thing which we call a Buddha nature. A beautiful, perfect, compassionate, kind little being. Sometimes it gets lost inside of you because we don't pay attention to the moment. We just run away from that. And because we run away from that, we go into finding fault with people and finding fault with ourselves. We go in comparing. My goodness, all this comparison business, which again creates a lot of self-hate. How on earth can you compare yourself with other people? One of the great teachings of the Buddha was what he called conceit. And what conceit means in Buddhism, it doesn't mean I'm better than you. That's only a third of conceit. Conceit means 
I am better. I'm the same. I'm worse. All judging, all comparing is called conceit in Buddhism. Fascinating. Because really all that I'm worse than somebody else is just an inverted form of conceit. Do you judge yourselves against other people? I don't judge myself against the other monks. Who's the best monk in the monastery? We don't have competitions at the end, end of every year. Give them an ex- examination or like have a meditation competition. Who can sit the stillest, the longest? We don't have like a meditation Olympics where we see who can actually rise into the air the highest. And you know, like the Olympic Games high jumps. <laughs> That's not what we do. That's never what we would never do. We don't sort of, you know, at the end of, I'm not quite sure, I hope you don't do this. Sort of, you know, at the end of the talk, you know, have a few people with the back with these numbers. Eight talk, nine talk. <laughs> Compare, the, you know, when Ajahn Wisudi gives a talk, you know, nine. Or uh, Sister Wayama, we don't have like a hit parade of monks and nuns. Who's the best nun? We don't compare. Hopefully you don't anyway, because each one, that gives a different talk, a different aspect, and that's wonderful. We don't see who's the best monk. That's why we don't have that comparison in our monastic orders. That's why we don't have like a head honcho. Okay, I'm the abbot, that just means that you have to do all the work. (laughs) Basically, that's what it means. That's why we call that the rest days in the monastery. Sometimes we have a rest day. And a rest day means when all the rest don't have to do anything, when I have to keep on working just the same. That's why I call it a rest day. (laughs) I always have to work. (laughs) But we don't actually compare. Because if you compare, you're asking for self-hate. If I compare myself to someone else, it's just the nature of things. We always compare, usually unfavorably. Because we see our faults and we see other people. You can't see the other people's faults. Sometimes our faults are most because they're closer to us, and that's what we see first of all. When we compare, we're never good enough. If I was went on that path, I'm a monk. My talks are never good enough. They can't be good enough. I know they're not good enough. If they were really good enough, if I really gave good talks, every one of you would have been enlightened years ago. <laughs> How long have you been coming here? Honestly, I must be a terrible <laughs> teacher. <laughs> so if I think like that, I get into all self. Hey, I'm really hopeless, I'm really terrible. But of course, we don't really think like that at all. So there's no judging. It's an important part of like, you know, learning about you know, letting go. We don't compare ourselves or judge with other people. How on earth can we judge? How can I judge even a monk sitting next to me? You know, I can't compare myself with him. Just completely different characters, different backgrounds, come from different places. How can you compare like an, an orange and an apple? They're just different fruits. And each one of you, a different tree in the forest. And all those different trees, the big ones, the small ones, the ones leaning to the left, leaning to the right, even the dead trees. And when I first went to those forests, you wanted to cut down the dead trees to make the forest, you know, get rid of all the dead wood. Until somebody told me, those dead trees in the, in the forest are very important. That's where the birds nest. They're very important for you know, a place where they, because they have the hollows in the trees, usually the, uh, the white ants eat out the scent of the Java trees, and that gives a nice little nest for the birds. It's just a very, very well-balanced ecosystem. So everything is necessary in a forest, even the dead trees, even the little white ants, everything has its place. How can you judge one tree from another, even a dead tree from a live tree? How can you judge like you know, the beautiful kookaburras or the crows? They're both necessary there. So we tend not to judge. When we don't judge, we don't compare. And everybody's got their place. When everyone's got their place, where can there be self-hate? Instead, this is love. The love means everyone has their place. The door of my heart's open to you. Thank you for being here. It's gratitude for the people we know in our life. It's gratitude for ourselves as well. And when we do make a fool of ourselves, we do make a mistake. Isn't that charming? You know, I, when I was a young monk, I tried so hard to learn Thai. But you know, I have, my gift of languages is not so good. I can sometimes speak Thai. 
And for many of you, you think, oh, Ajahn Brahm, you can speak so good Thai because you can't understand it either. I remember giving a talk in Thai you know, a few years ago and some Thai people came and said, oh, is he talking in Pali? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, it's not Pali, it's just I'm talking in Thai. <laughs> But they told me, uh, there's a few Thai people here, they told me, they say, it's much, l we're glad you don't speak good Thai because it's like charming when you make silly mistakes, it's good fun. And they told me that because there's a few of the other monks could speak perfect Thai. And they said they don't like listening to him because they, they, can, they can hear Thai from a Thai person, not like a Western monk. But when they hear a, a Western monk, you know, go, go, garble it up and say the wrong words and say sometimes you're supposed to be saying a good word but it turns out to be a rude word, they think it's so funny. <laughs> so I said, don't learn Thai too much. What you know now is good enough because it's, it's like lovable, it's like charming. So you don't have to be perfect to be charming, to be lovable. And that takes a lot of pressure off, <laughs> pressure off you. Now you can see that when you're human, people can relate to you. When you make mistakes, ah, oh, you're the same as me. And when you're the same as me, you become lovable, you become acceptable, you become reassuring. We don't all have to be absolutely perfect in this world. This whole idea of perfection and why we judge. I don't know if I told this story a lot. I used to tell this story in retreats. A very lovely little story about the Japanese garden. Many of you may have been to Japan. You know they're famous for their gardens. They have these amazing gardens and Actually, people go from all over the world to see these Japanese gardens and sometimes we try and make these Japanese gardens here in Australia. But this one amazing Japanese garden was one of the most famous in the whole of the country. And this old meditation monk wanted to find out why, what the secret of this monk was. So he arrived in this garden very early in the morning, this old meditation monk. He snuck in before opening hours and hid behind a bush he wanted to find out the secret. And hiding behind the bush, after a while, just after dawn, the gardening monk came out. He came out carrying two big wicker baskets. Now this garden had a big plum tree in the centre and it had rocks and gravel and moss. And he came out with those two baskets and he spent about three hours picking up every leaf and twig which had fallen the night before. He wouldn't just sort of gather them up and throw them in the, in the baskets. He would look at it first of all. He'd examine it. And if he thought it was useful, he put it in the good basket. If he thought it was a rubbish leaf or twig, he put it in a rubbish basket. He'd select every leaf and twig like that. That's why it took about three hours. And then he'd go behind the, the temple throw the rubbish leaves and twigs on a compost pile and then he would pause for tea and a little bit of meditation to prepare himself for the most important part of his gardening. After drinking tea, meditating and composing his mind, he'd go out with a good basket and he'd put every leaf just in the right place Sometimes he'd put it down, he'd stand back, and it wasn't quite right. He'd just turn it just a few degrees, and then he'd smile. That was right. And it took another three hours to place every leaf and twig just in the right position. He was one of these artists. You know, I can't do things like that. I haven't got like the artistic flair. I just bung them anywhere. But there are some people in this world who whether it's painting or sculpture or whatever, they've got this sense of like, you know, colour and sort of texture and how the whole thing relates to, to one another. So when he'd finished, that garden was spectacular. Now all the leaves, the way they sort of the colours and the shapes interplayed with themselves, it was a work of art. And that's why that people came from all over the country to admire his garden. And when he'd finished after this six or seven hours of just hard work, that's when the old meditation monk came out from the bush. And he came out to that monk and said, I'm, I've come to congratulate you. I've been watching all this time. I'm just watching you from the early morning. Just Your attention to detail, your patience, 
and your hard work is exemplary. I've never seen anything like this, said the old man. Your garden's almost perfect. At that word, almost. <laughs> almost perfect. All the colour drained from the monk's face. He went white. His back went up. What do you, do, 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 do you mean? He stuttered. Oh, oh, almost perfect. And then he went down on the floor as you do in Buddhism. You bow to the old monk. and said, oh master, you've been sent by the Buddha himself out of compassion to teach me how to make my garden even more perfect. Oh please, out of compassion, tell me your secret. How can I make you my garden more perfect? And the old man looked at him and said, do you really want to know? Oh yes, please, don't withhold your wisdom from me. Share it, oh compassionate, oh great one. He said, I'm making this up as I go along, as I usually do. <laughs> I really spoil the atmosphere, don't I? Never mind. <laughs> so the, the, old, the young monk begged the old master to teach him how to make his garden really perfect. You know what he did? He went to the centre of the garden and he put his old but strong arms around that plum tree and he shook the hell out of it. Twigs and leaves went all over the place. The young monk was horrified. His morning's work was ruined. Old rubbish old twigs and dirty old leaves went all over his beautiful garden. And when he was about to kill that old monk, <laughs> the old monk just looked at him and said, Now that's perfect. And that's the moral of that story. <laughs> you can't make it perfect by putting every leaf here and twig there, but isn't that what you do to yourself? Try and make yourself just perfect. When you go out at night, every hair has to be in the right place. I don't have that trouble. <laughs> every little pimple has to be put this cream on so it doesn't sort of come out. Every little crease has to be Botoxed out. <laughs> be yourself, be natural. Because that's what a, a beautiful garden is. It's not like a plastic perfect garden. In the most beautiful parts of nature, Nature is all over the place. Twe the leaves and twigs are in the where the water is supposed to run. The rocks are all sort of worn this way and that way. Water never goes in a straight line. It goes left and right over the rocks, underneath, the eddies around. That's beautiful. Just the chaos of nature. That's what makes nature beautiful. The chaos of human beings. Some good, not that good, some perfect. Not really perfect, but just close. That's the beauty of human beings. So why compare ourselves? Everyone has got their place. And that's what loving kindness means. Saying the door of my heart's open to you. Leaf and twigs, no matter how you fall in that garden. And then you're actually seeing the perfection. It's not the world out there. It's what you add to it makes it perfect. Self-hate. It's not that you are worthy of hate. It's just what you add to yourself. That's the only problem. So we stop comparing ourselves. We start to accept ourselves as we are. And even when we make mistakes, we can forgive those mistakes. That's what forgiveness is. Just allowing the trees to bend in the forest. You don't go around and say, you stupid tree. You know, why are you bending that way? You, know, you stupid plant, why did you die? Plants do die. And new ones get born, just like that. Just get a forest, that's what a forest is. And the ones which are dead are wonderful. They're the places where, where the birds nest. So when we have death in our family or in our community, that's wonderful. That's a place where compassion and understanding can nest. Where we can understand the beauty of death. Why do we hate death? Nothing wrong with death. Just death needs a PR job, that's all. <laughs> Public relations job. All right, I just uh, reading this little book I've just been written. I got this um, new idea. I've told this before, but it's a great little story. New idea of like the crematoriums in Perth. You've all been to a crematorium in Perth. You know that um, the old ones, the one at Karakata, you press the button and the coffin goes down. I've done so many funerals, and the problem is that when you press that button. I really get everybody nice and peaceful, you know, talk, you know, nice things. Even actually tell jokes sometimes at funerals. But when I press that button 
and it goes down. If people are going to cry, that's when the waterworks start, when you press that button. And it took me a while to understand why. Because like, even though it's supposed to in, um, replicate like, a, like a, a burial in a crematorium, because then you, know, you go down. What does that mean in our culture, going down? Where do we go down to? <laughs> You've got it, hell. <laughs> Isn't it a terrible sort of symbol there? You're going down. So many years ago, I had this idea. <laughs> You've got it. You press the button and you go up. And imagine that happening. You go up and you get all these like clouds of like dry ice. And you get all this heavenly music, something really inspiring and uplifting. And you go up through like, once the ice is there, through some trap door in the ceiling. They can take it to wherever they're going to burn it after. So imagine that, like heavenly music and going up and there's your Uncle George going up. That's wonderful. <laughs> so that was my suggestion for funerals. <laughs> but then somebody said that Ajahn Brahm, that would take away from the integrity of funerals because there are some people they know would never go up there. <laughs> so not being one to be sort of dissuaded, I refine the concept. This is what we do with like inventions. You've got to take the original concept, refine it, and have three buttons. One for going up, <laughs> one for going down, and one for going sideways. <laughs> and to make the funerals really interesting, you could take a vote on, <laughs> which, <laughs> on which button to press. Now, <laughs> Imagine go to, first of all, people would really want to go to the funerals, first of all, to find out which, and also have their vote, you know, so you could actually take a vote whether you should press the down button or the sideways or the up button. <laughs> They're just having a bit of fun with death, that's all. You want to have fun with death. So the point is that this is why we've got such self hate and such life hate. We hate that part of life called death. We don't understand what this self really is that we're hating. Because we hate the self, we run away from it all our lives. We never face up to it. Who we are. Always running away. Why are you running away from? And sometimes people say, as monks, we're running away. But my goodness, we're the ones who stay still and don't run at all. When you were meditating earlier on, why couldn't you stay still? Because you were running away from you. So you're running away from. Why do people go and get drunk, go and watch movies, go and just uh, take drugs? They're running away from themselves. Because they're not quite sure who they are. And they're a bit scared of who they are. Especially when they've been told off so many times in their life. As if we actually think that we're not really perfect. We're not good enough. So we've got faults. We feel guilty. We don't want to face ourselves. Fascinating when we meditate. It is the self-hate which stops us going deep in meditation. If we had that like, self-love, we allow ourselves to be. We wouldn't even actually put any demands on our meditation. It doesn't matter if you want to fall asleep, that's all right. What is wrong with falling asleep in meditation? It's not against the precepts. Don't do anything wrong. <laughs> We won't allow ourselves to do that, will we? Sometimes we're so uptight about what other people might think of us. If you snore when Ajahn Brahm's giving the talk. <laughs> Sometimes that's why even people get really bored and they like to leave, you know, go through the door. They can't stand the talk, but they won't go because they're afraid what other people think of you. How much of our life do we torture ourselves because we worry what other people think of us? You know that old story? When you're in your 20s, well, even before then, in your teens, you're really concerned what other people think of you. That's where you have to dress up as girls, where you have to you know, get some nice patter as blokes. When you're in your teens, early 20s, you're very concerned what other people think of you. When you get to about 40, you get self-confidence. You, you can't give a damn what other people think of you. And in your 40s, you don't care what other people think of you. And when you're finally 60, you finally realize that people weren't thinking about you anyway. <laughs> which is true they're thinking about themselves most of the time <laughs> so why, why what other people 
think of you. Remember, that's a very good saying. When you're in your teens, you worry what other people think of you. In your 40s, you can't give a damn what other people think of you. In your 60s, you realize they weren't thinking about you anyway. <laughs> it's, good, it's a good one to remember. <laughs> but now what we're doing here is that self-hate. They're not thinking about you, so why are you hating yourself? You're hating yourself because you p- think other people hate you. You're comparing yourself. You think you're not good enough. You are good enough. You've got Buddha nature inside. You're an important human being. You've all got your place in this cosmos, just like in the forest. You can accept yourself, be at peace with yourself. If you're at peace with yourself and accept yourself, you let go. You're not trying to live up to something. You're not trying to get the top marks in your meditation. You're not trying to be the super monk. My goodness, I've seen monks try that. Try to be the super monk. Try and be the super nun. Try and be the super president. (laughs) 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 Nah, he's a very good person. (laughs) What's that called? That's called stress. Are you trying to be the super wife? The super mum? The super husband? If you try that, you will actually, you will not live up to your potential. You're trying too hard. It's called stress. You get pain. You get sick. You die. Self-hate kills you. Instead of having self-hate, have self-love. It's the opposite. The door of my heart's open to me. Treat yourself just as you would treat other people. No more, no less. So you're kind to others, be kind to yourself. When you're kind to yourself, even if you're meditating, now oh, you fall asleep, that's okay. It's allowable. Because you, you know why you fall asleep? You know what the cause of falling asleep is? Because you're tired. <laughs> Obvious, isn't it? You know when I was a young monk, first year as a monk, I used to get very tired. I had no energy. And I wondered what was going on. And I asked one of these monks, he said, because you're not eating enough, that's why. Eat some more rice. An obvious solution, but I thought, I'm a monk, you're not supposed to eat very much. And because I was, had self-hate, I thought, I've got to be a tough monk. And I've got to be just number one monk in the monastery. And so you'd be up there, sort of, you know, looking at everybody else's bowl and making sure you finish first. And I find out the only way you can finish first is to eat faster. <laughs> but just because you eat faster doesn't mean that because you finish first doesn't mean you, you eat less. So there's lots of little things which we have and you can actually see that happening in your life competing. Even in a monastery people compete to be the best and it's, they just create problems for themselves. In life you compete to be the best and that's a problem. I think it would be wonderful in schools if we had less competition and more cooperation. Instead of always thinking you've got to get the top marks to be loved in the world. You've always got to be the most successful in your business. You've got to be a millionaire before you've made it in the world. My goodness, if money and possessions counted, I would be a complete and utter failure. All my life, what have I got to show for it? Just a dirty old robe, (laughs) beat up old bowl. My possessions in life I've accumulated. (laughs) But of course, that's not what you actually accumulate in life. Happiness is much more important. Contentment, peace. So you want to get anything in life, isn't that more important for you? So when we have self-hate, comparison and guilt, we can see what's going on there. And when you meditate, this is where you really test out how much you love yourself. To allow yourself to fall asleep. If your mind wants to go off somewhere, allow it to go off. Don't hate yourself, because if you're tired, there's a cause and reason for that. You've been working hard. You've been struggling to do so much. That's why you're tired. Allow yourself to be tired. If your mind goes wandering off, it must have some cause to it. Allow it. Let it be to love yourself as you are. Even to love your mind as it is. Whatever happens, okay, go for it, mind. I care enough for you. You can do whatever you want. Now, a strange thing happens when you do that. I've done that many times, and that's the most peaceful, quiet, beautiful meditations. That's when the mind stops wandering. That's when the mind stops being sleepy. It brightens up and gets so peaceful and so wonderful. So you're letting go. That's a trick of meditation. And you're feeling at peace with yourself. When you're feeling at peace with yourself, you're liking yourself as you are. There's no reason to be naughty anymore. 
There's no reason for monks to break their rules. Why would you break like the five precepts, killing another being? It's because you don't love yourself, you don't love others. Stealing, committing adultery, lying, taking alcohol and drugs, it's all escaping, that's all. If you really loved yourself, you'd be a virtuous person. If you accepted yourself as you are, you wouldn't go around being mean to others. It's because we hate ourselves, we take it out on others. That's why we get mean. I think Mr. Bush must really hate himself. <laughs> this is facade. Because how? If you love yourself, you're at peace with yourself, you're at peace with the whole world. You can't harm other people. Why? You're accepting yourself, you accept others. So, you find that when you do have that acceptance, instead of self-hate, peace, kindness, fulfillment actually comes. But each level of our meditation, you get different types of self-hate. This one particular story, it was, it was amazing. There was one nun in our monastery many years ago, staying for a short while, and she started getting into a deep meditation. You know, you've heard me talk about these deep meditations, read it in a book on jhanas, got Nimitta coming up and about to get into jhanas. You know, these deep bliss states in meditation, powerful, beautiful, wonderful states, more bliss than you've ever had in your whole experience. And, but she couldn't go any deeper. And when she came to talk to me in her interview time, she said something which I always remember. And I thought, oh, why do people have that problem? She said that I knew I could go into that full jhana, but I, never th I thought I don't deserve so much happiness. That's why I couldn't go in. A fascinating problem there. There was something, a barrier to almost like enlightenment. Enlightenment is the ultimate happiness. You know, huge amounts of happiness, more than you can ever think you can exist in the world. That's what enlightenment is. And she thought, I don't deserve so much happiness. That's self-hate. It's conditioned into us. We need to actually to overcome that. You deserve to be happy. You've got Buddha nature inside of you. You're a human being who should take away all the barriers to inner happiness. And that's the big barrier, self-hate. I'm not good enough. I don't deserve this. So it's my job to condition each one of you as I was conditioned myself. You deserve happiness. You deserve all the bliss in the world. When you actually take that barrier of self-hate, thing, I'm not, I don't deserve it. Maybe that's other, most monks and nuns, yeah, because you know, they're good people, they're goody-goodies, they never do any the rotten things which we do. And that's not true. Everyone deserves that happiness. Everyone deserves to bliss out. Have you ever noticed that sometimes in your life happiness comes? You think, I, I, this is not good. There's something wrong with this. I don't deserve this. Something must be terrible. Even these days, even some Buddhists, they spoil it all by saying, oh, if you get happy, you'll get attached to it. <laughs> oh, if you really bliss out, be careful, you never get to enlightenment that way. Ah, oh, just spoiling it all. You get so close and that little bit of self-hate spoils it all. So instead of having self-hate, we have that self-love, which is our opening the doors to happiness and bliss in your life. If you have that, forgive all your faults in the past. The whole past is gone. You deserve to be forgiven. Because you've got Buddha nature inside of you. That you are the most perfect, beautiful, wonderful being inside there. Therefore, you deserve to be forgiven. Any fault. If you've kissed somebody else's husband, yeah, okay. If you've done even worse than that, you deserve to be forgiven. In the time of the Buddha, there's a serial murder, murderer, Angulimala killed 999 beings. He was about to kill the Buddha. But the Buddha forgave him. And he became fully enlightened, just like that. And there were <coughs> prostitutes, terrible people. They're not terrible people. Just, but he forgave them. He didn't judge them at all. And they became the most amazing great nuns. Beautiful, wonderful, compassionate, enlightened beings. The point was you don't have to be perfect to be enlightened. Street sweepers, people with hardly any education, poor people, kings. didn't really matter. Anyone could become enlightened. Isn't that wonderful to understand? Don't have to be healthy. Don't have to have a degree. Don't have to have be a man or woman or be born in India or whatever. 
anyone. Because each one of you is welcome in enlightenment. The doors of enlightenment are open for you as well. Actually, they say that some people you can't be enlightened. If you killed your mum or killed your dad. Has anyone here killed a mum or dad? No? Okay, so you could all become enlightened. You're all welcome. <laughs> now, what that means is that you have the inner ability there. You have the possibility. So why have that self-hate? We can forgive. We can let go of it. Forgiving is letting go of the past. Why don't we do that? Why is we something happened in the past? We did this, or someone else did that to us. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. And it goes on and on, just like kids. Mummy, mummy, Johnny hit me. Yeah, but you know, Sarah hit me first. Now because that's why he, because he called me a camel. Ah, oh, because that's why he called me a dog. It goes on and on like that, doesn't it? And that's actually our life. They're supposed to be like two or three year olds, but now we're twenty year olds or forty year olds, sixty year olds. Keep on going on like that. No, 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 they blew up my twin towers. Ma, 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 they... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble one day. <laughs> but I think I'm in, tr- in trouble now. <laughs> but you've got to be very careful <laughs> about just the way that we hate other people or where we hate ourselves. Let go of the past, for goodness sake, to free yourself for the present moment. When you free yourself for the present moment, you're free to laugh, you're free to be happy, your self-hatred is gone. You can meditate, you can let go of the past completely. What you've got to think about if you let go of the past and forgive the past? What you've got to fear for the future? When you can say to yourself, the door of my heart is open to me all the time. When you know that the garden is perfect, as it is, you're perfect as you are. Stop trying to make yourself something different. How many times we want to make ourselves something different? You're sick and you want to make yourself well. Allow yourself to be sick. Sickness, the door of my heart's open to me. Usually you get better then. <laughs> or I'm old. Old age, the door of my heart's open to me. Or you're fat. Fat. The door of my heart's empty. <laughs> so it's the attitude is a problem. I think people die not because they're fat, because they hate being fat, or because they're tense, or because they, you know, they're just too screwed up inside of themselves. And I say that's the reason why I put on weight as a monk, because I don't worry mm. enough. <laughs> but anyway, so self-hate actually stops you in each of the one of these points getting happiness. So if you don't allow yourself to become happy, if you don't allow yourself to enjoy the moment, you don't allow yourself to be as you are, don't allow life to be as it is in this moment. Sometimes we have to work, yeah, sure. But why is it we can never stop? We can never stop, allow ourselves to be, allow life to be, enjoy ourselves. Stop being so judgmental, so critical, so critical, yeah, Sort of monks are evil, yeah, gays are evil, yeah, heterosexuals are evil, yeah, this is evil, that's evil, everything is evil. It's because we think we're evil, that's why. It's amazing, when you don't judge yourself, you don't judge others. That's what it says, actually, in the Christian Bible, judge not, lest ye be judged. If you judge others, it doesn't mean that God is judging you. I worked that one out a long time ago, before I was a Buddhist even. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Men, if you judge others, you judge yourself. You be judged by you. So stop judging yourself. Just a last little story. I remember one of the German monks told me this story because they had this booklet from Germany. It hasn't been published in English. It should be because it had these stories of like um, kids who remember these out-of-body experiences. And this one fascinating um, tale was this young kid who was some accident or some disease, only about eight or nine or something, he died in the hospital, came back to life again afterwards, and he told his story of actually floating out of his body and going along these like, on this countryside somewhere, coming to this like shed. And in this shed was this, some sort of like angel of death and just uh, checking out all the people who had just died. And so he went into this shed and what's your name? He said, you're not supposed to be down here. You're not supposed to be dead. But before we send you back, you can stay here and watch what happens. 
The next person to come in was a German farmer. He just died. And this is a little boy recounted this. And the man sort of looked in the book, what's your name? Oh yeah, we got you down here. And he said, have you ever killed anybody? Killed anything? He said, oh, maybe only one or two little things. And the angel turned around to this boy, see, even when he's dead, he lies. <laughs> you know, he said, kills so many sheep and cows, and he only says one or two. <laughs> and then, as they were talking like this, this other person just went right past the shed, and went way up into the sky. The little boy said, why aren't you asking him to what he does? And the angel turned around. This is the, mo- the most beautiful part of this story. He said, see that man going up there to heaven? He never judged anyone in his whole, whole life. Therefore, we're not going to judge him. I always liked that little story. And this, when this little boy came back to life again, this is how he explained his experience, his out-of-the-body experience. A person going up to ultimate happiness, we're not going to judge him because he never judged anybody. You judge yourself at death. That person reading the book is you. No one else. You can't lie to yourself. You might try, but you won't be able to. So when we don't judge, then we don't have self-hate. You have self-love. The door of my heart's open to you, no matter who you are. The door of my heart's open to me. You don't have self-hate. What more do you want in life? You have all the riches in the world when you don't hate yourself. Because you're at peace. Okay. That's the talk this evening. Hope you liked it. On self-hate and its opposite.